Thank you for taking the time to listen to our weekly service. This is a listener-supported ministry, and we ask that you pray and see what God would have you give. Now let's get to our sermon for today. Well, I, I've been doing some reading, doing my normal uh, Bible reading, and I couldn't help but notice how important leadership is. I never realized it until I was sitting there reading through the Old Testament. Israel, when they had leadership, served God. And every time a leader died and there was not another leader to take its place, Israel went backwards. Every time, without fail. And uh, uh, they would start worshiping false gods. You know, they weren't supposed to marry outside, you know, to keep it within the Jewish community. And they would start doing that. And it just it went on and on. And I just, after doing my reading, I noticed like what there were exceptions, like Moses, for instance. When Moses gave up, or God said he couldn't go to the promised land, and uh, Joshua was there to take his place. So it was, you know, one right after the other. So there was no chance for Israel to go backwards. But at the end of Joshua's reign, when he died, there was nothing. And right away, Israel started going backwards. And having. Having leadership, I realize, is extremely important. I never thought of it before until reading the Old Testament and all through this. And also having a bad leadership is just as bad as not having any leadership. And what I want to do is I'm going to compare two leaderships this morning that are in the Old Testament. But before I do that, I want to give you a little background on Israel's leadership. Uh, And basically it all comes from the Old Testament. And first of all, Israel's leadership, the first thing took place was what we call the patriarchs. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were the founding fathers of the nation of Israel. It all started with Abraham when God called him to go west, young man, go west. He didn't tell you where he was going west. Not until half the journey did God finally tell him, you're going to Canaan. And that was the start of the Jewish and Israel coming together and, or becoming a Jewish nation. And then all these were patriarchs were good leaders. All His son and his son's son all were good leaders and led Israel in a good way. But then after they stopped, then comes in what we call the judges came in to play. Israel was without uh, leadership for a while and backslid and God had to bring other countries in to wipe them out or whatever and take them, you know, prisoners in their own country and all. Well, God brought in what he called judges. There were three basic types of judges. Uh, They were either political, they were spiritual, or they were military. They were one or the other. Some might have had two uh, two of the things, of the three. But basically, you'll see some were basically political, some were military leaders like Gideon. For instance, okay, he he was a military when he came in. He didn't even want to do be part of that. And on God said, "No, I want to use you." And uh, and uh, so they were uh, judges themselves. Next came kings, and God never intended for Israel to ever have a king. And uh, God wanted to, in essence, be their king. But Israel cried and cried and cried. We want to be like the other countries. We like to have a king over us. God warned them what a king would do, even a good king. You know, taxes and all. But we know what that's like living under, you know, the United States with our government. And uh, and God said, now listen, that's going to happen. So he reluctantly agreed to install a king. So Saul becomes the first king of Israel. And then after Saul, we have David is the next king, and after David, Solomon. Uh, During the time of David and Solomon, Israel became one of the greatest nations in in what the known world was of that day. And they were of the greatest power and influence of that whole world. And if you read about Solomon and how they came from all over the known world just to visit him, just to hear of his uh, wisdom and all that, plus they kept giving him money. And give any money, and it goes into detail how much, how many servants he had, how much food was on the table, and everything in the Word of God just to do his court and those people that kept coming and giving him stuff, just unreal. 
after Solomon, uh, Israel became a divided kingdom. The problem was all the kids started fighting among themselves, you could say. I'm putting it in my English here. And we ended up having two kingdoms. Number one, the north was Judah. That was the kingdom for the north. Israel was the kingdom of the south. And that's what it ended up breaking into two kingdoms. And each of them had their own kings. David ended up being in the north during his time before they came together. But unfortunately, they had good leaders during that time, and they had bad leaders, kings. And unfortunately, the bad ones led uh, Israel away from God, while the good ones brought them back to God. Judah had a total of 20 different kings during its time of separation. Israel had 19 different kings. And you can see that the nation of Israel was like a yo-yo effect, up and down, up and down, as they were serving God, or God had to bring judgment down upon them. They suffered much because of this. And I want to give you an example today of a bad king and a good king. Naturally, I'm going to pick Saul as the first one, as being the bad leader. Saul did not do right in God's sight. He went to battle and did not do all God asked him to do. And if you look on 1 Samuel 15.3, it's where we'll start. It says, Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have, and spare not, but slay both men, women, infant, suckling, ox, sheep, camel, and ass. He was supposed to wipe everything out, bring nothing back, nothing. But then in verse 9, we find out that he spared the king and all the good animals, anything that was really good. He brings them back. And then in verse 10, it says here that he came, then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel. Now, Samuel was the high priest of that time. He's the one that anointed Saul and actually anointed David, too, when he became king. So Samuel was basically a really good uh, uh, high priest. So anyhow, God comes to him in this verse 10 and says, Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, and he is turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments, and it grieveth and it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. God didn't ask Saul to do anything, how would you say, hard. Why he was there, he killed everybody else. Why didn't he kill the king? He had to bring the king back. He killed all the other animals. Why didn't he kill the good ones? Which is what God told him to do. But he brought them back. So we got a problem here. And uh, in verse 15, let's see, we did 15, verse 15, let's see, Wait a minute, I'm going to make sure I just jumped here. And Saul, uh, and Samuel, okay. I get ahead of myself. Okay, here's where we're at, verse 13. Verse 13, and Samuel came, now Samuel comes to Saul to visit him after God speaks. And uh, Saul says to him, and I love this, this is, to think about this, this is basically what Saul says. He says, blessed be thou the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. He didn't do that. But he came up, man, I did a great job, I did everything God wanted me to do. And Samuel tells him, I'm not reading this verse, but Samuel tells him, he says, don't I hear the animals you were supposed to kill? Don't I hear these animals up right here? What's going on? And then in verse 15, Saul says this. Saul said, they have brought them from the Amalekites, and of the people spared the best of the sheep of the ox." And sacrifice to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. Now I want you to think about this. This is an important lesson just for us. When God tells you to do something, don't take it upon yourself to change something. 
He's saying, we're going to do something good. We're going to sacrifice to God these good animals. But he didn't do what God asked him to do. And God pronounces a judgment on him because of that. Just because you do something good doesn't mean it's right. If it's in God's will, it's right. If God says it's right. And we're going, and he's sitting there go justifying what he did was wrong. And I'm going to justify it because we're going to sacrifice to God. And then later, which I'm not going to get into because I didn't want to keep reading, reading all the verses. But later Saul starts to blame the people caused him to do that. Now wait a minute. He's the king. He's the one commanding. He's the leadership. And that he's saying he let he didn't let the people do it. He was using that as an excuse because he was a lousy leader. Then he goes on to this quote, and if you do anything today, underline verses 22 and 23 because these are life-changing verses. Oh, okay, you already got it. First Samuel 15:22, and it says, and Samuel said. The high priest, okay, has the Lord his great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. He tells him, hey, wait a minute. Is God really delighted because you brought these sacrifices to do to him? He's saying, obeying the Lord, that's what counts. That's what God is looking for in your life. Not what you think is right. Even though it was a good thing to do sacrifices to the Lord back then. So it was a good thing, but not done in the right way. He didn't listen to God. Then he goes on here, Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. He said, then he pushed, he gives a meaning to this. For rebellion is a sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is iniquity and adultery because thou has rejected the word of the Lord he also has rejected thee of being king from that day forth Samuel Saul went down downhill he had nothing but problems from that day forth now David enters the scene here Saul is having problems because God's not with him anymore not blessing him He's having times of depression. I guess I'm going to use the word depression. He's feeling bad. So someone says, by the way, there's this guy, David, that plays the harp. He can come in and play music to you and make you feel better. And they bring him in, and the music makes him feel better. So now he ends up being in the court. Well, then as that occurs, get, the, Goliath comes into the scene. David goes out there to feed his brothers, to give some stuff that his mom and dad said to give, and he sees what happens. You know the story, how he ends up killing Goliath. Then they come back, and now Saul's really tickled about, uh, about David. This is really cool. So now David ends up fighting in the army with Saul. But there's a problem that occurs. They come back now from the fights, and guess what happens? The ladies and all are singing songs and all, and they're going... Uh, Saul killed his thousand, David killed his ten thousand, and guess what? He starts getting jealous. And now he ends up wanting to kill David. And he starts throwing spears at him when they're sitting down for dinner. And by the way, David ends up marrying one of his daughters, you know, during this whole process. So now he's even related. And yet Saul is after him. And now for quite a few chapters, all you read about is Saul trying to find David and kill him. Saul's whole life just goes downhill. Bad leadership. Not doing what God says to do. Simple things. It wasn't hard. And doesn't Jesus say in the New Testament, he says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Following God is not hard. We make it hard because of this word back here, stubbornness. We want to do everything our way. And it pays to have good leadership. And here we got bad leadership and it's running uh, Israel downhill, big time. Saul gets to the point where he's so bad off that he goes to mediums. You know, saucers and all to, to talk to them. You know, God won't listen to him. So he goes there and has Samuel brought up out from the dead. Because Samuel's dead now during this time. And he says, what are you calling me up for? 
He says, I have to talk to you. Do something. Give me some direction how to fight the Philistines and all. He's really bad off and he's stooping to the worst things to do. Bad leadership. And, and through that, by the way, they tell him that he's going to die at this next battle. And the saddest part about the whole thing is the fact that Jonathan, his son, which was a good kid, him and David were like blood brothers. He ends up dying in that same battle. And that's the shame of it all. Saul did not do what God wanted him to do, and it, and it haunted him to the day he died. And because of that, Israel suffered because of bad leadership. Now let's look at a good leader, David. Very next king. It's a good example. David had several opportunities during his time when Saul was after him to kill Saul. To the point where he was standing above Saul while they were all sleeping. And, he, and his men said, here's your opportunity. God gave you the opportunity. And he kept saying one thing. I will not kill God's anointed. G David had the right heart for God. Was he perfect? No. Did he sin? Yes. And I'm going to give you an example. Some biggies. But he had the right heart. And I'm going to show to you how that makes such a big difference. And look in Acts chapter 13, uh, 13 verse 22. <clears throat> This gives you an example. Part of it we don't need to worry about, but it says, And when he had removed him and raised up David to be their king, to whom he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. God knew what David was going to do. Did he do wrong? Yes. But there's a difference. When you have the right heart and you do something wrong, David never gave an excuse why he did wrong. If you read the history of David and when he made the mistakes, he always confessed it right away to the Lord. He did have a heart after God. I wanted to serve God, even when he made stupid mistakes. And one of them is Beersheba. Now he's sitting home, and you know how they build the... There are cities and different things, always on hills and all, and his, actually his house, being the king, was on the top. And he's out on the roof looking around, just, you know, enjoying the day, and happens to look down on another house. There's Beersheba on the top. He sees her, I guess they're close enough to where he sees she's beautiful, and says that she's a very beautiful woman. And he brings her in, ends up having sex with her, and she gets pregnant. So David decides, okay, this is a bad situation here. Her husband is out battling with Joab, with Joab's second command of Israel under David. They're battling against the city. So he sends a messenger to Joab and says, listen, send her husband back. So his idea was get him back, send a false thing, just to give me an update of what's going on with the war, but send him back. And then when he's back, he says, okay, you go to see your wife while you're here. Spend a day or two, relax. But a guy was such a nice guy, he says, how can I spend time with my wife when the rest of my comrades are back there and can't be? So he sat and slept at David's door. He wouldn't go to his wife. He never did. So David takes the next step and goes, I got a problem here. So now he sends a letter, gives it to her husband to go back to Joab, and the letter says, kill Joab. And the, I mean, I killed the husband. And what they do end up doing is, he says, go up against the wall where it's real dangerous, and then back off. But don't tell him that you're backing off. And what happens is they end up, he gets killed. So he ends up dying. Well, God brings that up to him. What are you doing, David? Not only did you do wrong with Beersheba and have, get her pregnant and all, and you end up killing her husband. David right away repented. And he had a sorrowful heart. And that's what made the difference of a good leadership and a good person of David. Because he responded the right way, right away. He didn't give excuses and say, man, I didn't know what I was doing. You know, I shouldn't, you know. He immediately asked forgiveness. And that was just being a part of being a good leadership. And that's what made him special in God's sight. Not that he was perfect, and he didn't give the excuse, but he had the right, I want to serve the Lord. And listen, I know times, all of us probably go through this, I want to do right with the Lord. I find myself doing wrong, 
and I got to confess it. And sometimes I say, Lord, it seems like I keep confessing the same sins back over again. But you know what the key is? You got to keep confessing your sins back over. You got to have that forgiveness heart and not play games with God. 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 6. Listen, this is just another example. An uh, 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 army came and took some of his people, their wives and all, while the soldiers were out doing something. Now they were mad at David. And it says, David was greatly distressed for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people were grieved, every man for his son and for his daughters. So what does David do? But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And that's what David kept doing. That's what a good leadership does. Kept going back to God. What should I do? God told him, you go to go after him. I know they're more than you are, but you'll take them. You'll get everybody back. And he did. Every time David was going to go out to war, you know what he did? He always asked the high priest, is it God's will? Does God want me to do it? And most of the time, not always, but most of the time, God would not only say, yes, go. He'd even tell him how to fight the battle. Do Go this, do this, go behind him, whatever. Wait for the rushing and the sound uh, in the trees and everything. God said, I'll fight the battle for you. And sometimes he just said, just go, you're going to win. But every time he did, and some of the bad kings didn't. A lot of them just went to war. Some of them, there's the section I just read not recently, I forget what book I'm in right now, <laughs> but uh, where they brought the Ark of the Covenant because they kept losing. That's what's going to help us. But they were out of the will of God. And it didn't help them. They kept losing even when they had the Ark of the Covenant with them. And all, because they didn't have the right leadership and they didn't have the right relationship. David and Curry, and there's 42 verses in the Bible that talk about this subject as far as encouraging themselves in the Lord. It wasn't always David, but it's just amazing how many verses talk about it. Now, you obviously know right now what the last seven and a half years has produced under a bad leadership. Just, just, just being a bad leadership. Somebody that was never trained to do what, he, what they're doing. And, all. and the more I'm finding out, uh, I don't know if you had the opportunity. I think I brought it up a little bit last week that uh, it was a Secretary of Defense or whatever. Uh, the last three that were under the Obama administration, they interviewed them, and every one of them are saying Obama never, his cabinet, they were unexperienced people, financiers, all of them. None of them knew what they were doing. Bad leadership. A good leader like Reagan did, he had some good people. Reagan was a good administrator. He knew what people to pick to have underneath him. He knew how to tap into people with resources. We need leadership in the Christian realm. And I hate to say this, but we have churches today. Even in our biker realm, we have biker churches that are leading people off the wrong road. When I think of some of the guys that used to come here in the past and something, forget the biker, just a regular church. And when they would tell me what was going on at that church, it just blew me away that people were so blind, they didn't see that, and yet it was out in the open for them to see. And, and then you got people, I, I can't tell you how many times I've had people say this, Glenn, you're preaching. It's always, don't do this, don't do that, or do this and do that. Why well, I got a question for you. Think about this. When you go to school or college, what are they teaching you? What to do and what not to do. You go to high school, it's the same thing. Any class you go to, that's what you're learning. You're learning what to do and what not to do. And God's word, that's all it's about. How to be a good Christian. How to be close to him. Don't do this. Do this. And, when, and then I have Christians, I've had, a, I've had quite a few people tell me this over the years, not just in the biking world, but I don't have to go to church. This proves wrong. This proves them wrong. Because without good leadership above them, they're not going to be doing the things that they need to be doing. You've got to have people that are going to preach the word in season and out. And you've got to preach what the word says, even if it's unpopular. 
Do you, nobody here wants to be told you're doing wrong. I don't either. But you got to accept the fact when you're doing wrong, you take care of it and you change it. And God blesses those that follow him. And what does he do? Just as is Israel, he brought in other countries to take him over when they were doing wrong. And God brings in problems to us when we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing. But you can tell God, well, wait a minute, God. I, I go to service every Sunday. I do the bike runs. I'm trying to witness and all. But you're still not doing what you know is right to do between you and the Lord. And God's not going to bless you. Oh, you might get a couple things happen. But I always tell people, just because something good happens to you, don't mean it was of God. God might have permitted that to happen. But there's a whole difference when you're in the right relationship with the Lord and how he works. It's just unreal. I mean, the impossible becomes possible. Things happen from you have no idea where they're coming from. And, it just, and it's continuously over and over and over again. My greatest joy here is to see every one of you so bubbling over when you come in here that I have to shut you down just so we can do the service. And there's no reason why every one of you should be not bubbling over every week with what God's doing for you. At work, at play, riding your bike, whatever. But if you're doing the right things with the Lord, you can't play Christian. And you need good leadership. And I try to be that leader. But I'm not perfect either. I made a mistake a couple weeks ago. And by the way, if you think I made a mistake or misquoted something... You should, at the end of the service, bring that up and say, what about this? What about that? You may be perfectly right. You may be wrong. I don't know until we look at it. But we need to find out. Why do you bring your Bibles? To make sure what I'm saying is true. It's important that we have good leadership. I always remember somebody that told me that they got on an airplane one time. I, I'm not sure if I ever said this to you or not. But he got on an airplane and he sat down. And there was a couple in front of him. And he thought he recognized the guy, but he wasn't sure who he was. But he said the woman behind him looked like a prostitute. And he says, I mean, it's just, that's what she looked like. Then all of a sudden, somebody else walked in the plane up to it and said, Oh, Pastor such and such. And it was one of the pastors in Greenville. And that ended up being his wife. Showing the wrong image. And everybody I know that's seen her says the same thing. So, we got bad leaders. We got people leading good bikers down the wrong road. And I hate to say that, but we do. And we got to be careful with stuff like that. Because the leadership is wrong. What they're doing is, is a popularity. Can we? I could double, triple our attendance easily. Just change the music. Change a couple things. I could do it. But I'm not going to sacrifice what God teaches for the sake of people. You know, you bring in people and say, hey, look, we're successful. That's not what we're about. We're about growing in the Lord and getting... I'll end with this. As a church in... Uh, California, a huge church, many, many thousands. I don't want to uh, say who it is. But one day I was having a meeting with Doc Hay. And, Doc, and I've heard of this church before and all that. And uh, a lot of people in the church world know about that church in California and uh, how it's a mega church. And uh, he said, look at this article, Glenn. I said, what is this? This is the pastor of the church. And I looked at it and went, oh, okay, so I read it. And this is what the basic of it is. After all these years, and this church so big, they realize nobody's growing. Nobody's getting up because they're, doing, they're entertaining the people. They weren't preaching the word the way it's supposed to be preached. And the pastor realized that and says, we need to change. I went, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord that they uh, saw that. But so many other ones, like this one in town that I brought up, mentioned that he stood on the roof of his church one time talking about how he's got all this money coming in from different sources and, I, and everything about him is about money and I got this from the people that were in the administrative area that that's all this guy worries about we got to be careful with the leadership that we put ourselves under and that includes watching me 
and praying for me and making sure I stay. Because let's say I'm good. I know I'm not a great speaker, but at least I give the, the right words. And it, say I can go wrong in the next month or two or next year. I don't know. And uh, I just saw somebody walk. I wanted to make sure somebody wasn't doing something to one of our vehicles. All of us are prone to go backwards if we draw back from the Lord. And we, you got to keep me up in prayer and keep me straight. We're all human. David was human. He made mistakes. But we got to have the right heart. And I hope today you understand how important leadership is. Whatever you do. Let's pray. We pray that we have been a blessing to you. For further assistance, call us at 864-270-1472 anytime. Send email to info at stlmm.org or visit our website at www.stlmm.org. Like any ministry, it costs money to operate. Please consider supporting this ministry as God leads you with your prayers and your financial gifts by going to www.stlmm.org and clicking on Donations.